while we're finishing up this particular section of the Tomorrow Church. And in this series, we've been looking at what the future will look like and what things from the past can help us to move into the future. We spent some time looking at church leadership. We looked at elders and deacons and overseers. And then we spent some time looking at the spiritual gifts that people have. We looked at Ephesians 4.11, where it says that some were called to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. And we've spent some time over the last few weeks looking at what the early church did from Acts chapter 2. They gathered together for the apostles' teaching, for fellowship, for breaking of bread, and for prayer. But they also did one other thing when they came together in Acts chapter 2. They, they came together to pool their resources and to give to anybody that had need. Just listen to what it says. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. I've always marveled at this section because if you look at it and you think about it, it almost sounds like a commune, doesn't it? Where people come together and they pool their resources and they just live together in perfect harmony. I had a friend in my neighborhood growing up and I learned that after high school, this friend went to uh, Northern California and lived in a commune. And communes sound great on the surface, right? Everybody comes together. They all live in perfect harmony. But if you know anything about communes, they're just not sustainable. Because once all the resources are gone or once people lose interest in the commune, once the energy is gone and dissipated, it's really, really, really hard to live in a commune. And here in the early church, they came together and they pooled their resources together and they gave it away. Well, that's not sustainable. I mean, other things are sustainable. They came together for teaching. Well, if you've got a good teacher, that's a sustainable thing. They, they came together for fellowship. That's sustainable. Prayer, that's sustainable. Uh, meals together, that's sustainable. But giving everything away, that's just not sustainable. Because once all the stuff is gone, what do you have to give away? One of the things about the church is we know that it is sustainable. That for 2,000 years, the church has lived and survived doing the commands of Jesus, doing the things that Jesus called, about, called them to do. Um, it is sustainable. It's expandable. If you uh, start a business, let's say you start a fast food business, you, you buy the food, right? And then you cook the food and you, and you get the taste just right. And you have the employees and you show them, okay, this is how you cook the food. Th this is what it should taste like. This is how you package it. This is how you sell it. And you work out all the kinks, right? When you first start out, it's not sustainable. There are things that are going to go wrong, but eventually you hone in on a model that's like, this works. We can buy the food from here. We can package it here. We can cook it here. We can sell it for this price and people will come and they'll buy it. And once you get that model sustainable, then you can take that model and you can take it to different locations because it's sustainable. It's a sustainable model. And we know the early church was a sustainable model, but when you just look at it, it's like, how could it possibly be sustainable if they just come together and they give everything away? It just doesn't make sense. And yet it does. And yet it did. And we're going to take a look at that this morning. We're going to look at this idea of coming together, of pooling resources and serving the world around them in such a way that it is sustainable, because it is. And the way that we're going to look at that is we're going to look at a story that Jesus told. It's a parable. You've all heard this parable before. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's in Luke chapter 10. And I think as we go through this parable, you will see how it is that the early church was able to create a sustainable model that's carried us for 2,000 years. 
And so let's just start reading in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said, do this and you will live. Now, just a couple of things to note here in this particular section of Scripture. The the teacher of the law was a teacher of the law. He was a spiritual guide. He was somebody that understood the law at least as well as Jesus understood the law. He had probably spent hours and hours and days and years studying the law. He knew it at least as well as Jesus did. And he comes, and what does it say? He wanted to test Jesus. He wanted to see if Jesus understood the law. He wanted to put a scenario in front of Jesus that perhaps tested who Jesus was and whether or not he was being faithful to the Old Testament law. And Jesus turns a question back on him and he says, well, how do you read the Old Testament law? And the man answers with the answer that would be the answer that any teacher of the law would have given. It's basically two Old Testament scripture verses. The old one is the Shema, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And then from Leviticus, chapter chapter 19, verse 18, um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two things would have been These two Old Testament sections would have been something that every teacher of the law would have known because this is what they taught, that that God is love and God's love is manifested in two ways. One is that we love God and that, that we should take that love and love our neighbor. In the Old Testament, um, they, uh, that Moses received the Ten Commandments from God, right? The, the, the Ten Commandments were God's law. And then as Israel grew and multiplied, they expanded those Ten Commandments as interpretations of what those Ten Commandments looked like. And they had 613 laws on the books. And these laws would tell you how it is to interpret the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments were all about love. And the Old Testament knew this. They knew that the first part of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These things are how to love God. And then the rest of the Ten Commandments, do not murder, do not bear false witness, do not commit adultery. These are loving your neighbor. And so when the Old Test, when the teacher of the law was asked, how do you read the Old Testament? It was all about love. Loving God and loving your neighbor. The whole entire Old Testament is rooted in love. Why? It's because love is part of the human condition. Love is the part of God that he has breathed into mankind. It's what separates us from other animals. It's love. It's that feeling that we get, that that joy that we get, that, that part of who we are that is God ordained into humanity. The love part is what separates us from other, other animals. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, you know, I have a dog and my dog loves me. Yes, I've had many dogs in my life and I love my dogs and they loved me. I cared for them. They gave me joy. I love dogs. But dogs cannot experience love in the same way that humans can. There is a special amount of godness that was given into humanity to separate us from all the other animals that we can experience love in a deep, deep, rich, nourishing way. Now, dogs may come close to that. We may feel unconditional love from a dog, but a dog is a little bit separate. Cats are separate. Well, I don't know if cats experience love. I mean, a cat's a cat. You know, they just sit around there doing whatever cats do. 
But love is endemic to the human. It's part of who we are. It's what sets us apart from everything else. We are created in God's image, and God is love. And the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He said, listen, you can have all the great things in the world, but if you don't have love, you're like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal because love is everything. Love is what separates us from other people. And if you love or you are loved, that is an important part of being human. People who aren't loved are really stinted in life. They, they are, they're shortchanged in life. They're not completely whole in life. People who are completely overwhelmed with love, they have this ability to love others. But it goes deeper than that. Because Jesus now tells a story about love. In verse 29, it says, But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man in his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to an innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now this is... You've heard, I'm sure, this story before, but it's an amazing story. This man is going down on the road, and he sees this man, and what does he see? He has pity on him. He wants to stop, and he wants to help him because he has pity. He has compassion. Um, when, when Jesus tells this story, people knew this route from Jerusalem down to Jericho. It was a very, very dangerous route, and there would be robbers on this road. And when people went on this road, sometimes they would get robbed, sometimes they would be killed, sometimes they'd be left for dead. And the Samaritan would have known that. The people would have known that. To stop there would actually kind of be very foolish. I remember years ago, I was at seminary, and um, I, I was going downtown, and I was coming back from downtown, and somehow I took the wrong turn. And this was before GPS in your car. I mean, th this was a long time ago. And I ended up in this part of East St. Louis with cars up on blocks and the street is quiet and there's not very many street lights. And all of a sudden I had this huge feeling that I was not in the nicest part of town. And imagine I'm in this part of town and I see off to the side of the road a person with a white flag up or something like that. And, you know, they're trying to hail me down because they're broken down. Would I stop and help them? And I probably, I mean, you'd have to think twice before you do that. And that is kind of the image that is portrayed when Jesus talks about this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It just wasn't a safe spot for this man to stop and actually help. He was risking his life. But then he does even more than that. He puts him on the donkey and he takes him to the nearest inn and he gives two denarii to this person. It's a you know, it's probably, um, you know, a month's worth of rent for them to be able to, to, uh, to make sure that this guy is taken care of. So, you know, two, two months worth of rent, a denarii is about a month's worth of rent. It's a significant amount of money. The guy sacrificed a lot in order for him to heal or to bring healing. You see, it takes two things in order to love the world, right? In, in order to love this person off to the side of the road. One is to have compassion. And the other is to have means. And if you've got compassion and you've got means, and you've got this ability, you can love the world around you. A lot of people have compassion, but they don't have means. And that's what's so great about when we come together as a church is because when we come together as a church, there might be a lot of people who have means, but they just don't have the time to be able to deal with all of the hurting and the sickness in the world around us. 
but they're willing to help support. And then there's other people that have a lot of compassion and they want to get their hands dirty, they want to do it, but they don't have the means. And so when the church comes together, we can create both of those things. We can have compassion and we can have means. The, the Levi and the, and the teacher of the law, the, the priest and the Levite that walked by, they may have had compassion and they may have had means, but they didn't have it together because they didn't stop and they didn't help this person. They, did, they ignored him. Whatever was in front of him, they ignored him. See, what God has called us to do is not just to love, but to have this sacrificial love to give up of ourselves, of our time and our talent and our treasures, to help those that are hurting in the world around us. I look at all the conflicts of the world around us and I think, you know, what can we do as a church to help in these situations? How can we show compassion? How can we do take the gifts that God has given us and use them sacrificially to love the world around us? How can we use our time and talent and treasure to do that? And we can, but is it sustainable? Or is it also unsustainable that once it's gone, it's just not sustainable? But li listen to the last part of the story in verse 36. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do. See, Jesus commands us to do these things. Why? It's because there's something amazing that happens when you sacrificially give of yourself to another person. You begin to build your compassion you begin to build your love. The more you give, the more love grows inside of you. In uh, whenever I talk to people about to be married, I'll talk about this, that, you know, one of the best thing you can do for the person you love is just to do things for them because the more you sacrifice and do things for the other person, the more love will grow. And the more love grows, the more you want to do stuff for the other person. And the more you do stuff for the, more, for the other person, the more love grows. This is the human condition. This is the way that we were created. We show love and compassion because God created us to show love and compassion. You see, it's easy to show love and compassion to those that you love. But it is hard to show love and compassion to those that may be your enemy. As you all know, the Jews and the Samaritans, they did not like each other. So when Jesus told this story about a Jew and a Samaritan, it was really shocking because Jews would not normally help Samaritans and Samaritans would not normally help Jews. How is this possible then? It's because of Jesus. You see, Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't love us because we do things or we care for other people. He loves us because we are his and we're in his kingdom. He just loves us unconditionally. And when that love comes into us, we share that love with the world around us. And the more we share with the world around us, the more love grows. The more this sacrificial love grows. And the more it's sustainable. You see, every single religion in the world believes in love. Like love is a universal thing. But if you look at the way those religions define love, it's kind of a different way. For example, uh, in some religions, they say, well, you need to love other people because in some way those love other people and they love other people. And eventually, you know, through the process of, you know, paying it forward, eventually it comes back to you. And so when, when you're loving other people, it's basically loving yourself. Or there may be other people that or other religions say you got to love because love is kind of what makes the world go around. And if you want the world to go around well, then you got to love more. It's like the grease that kind of that's in the cogs of the wheel. And the more love it is, the more the wheel can spin. But neither of those things are sustainable. The only thing that's sustainable is the love of Jesus. Because that love isn't dependent upon trying to see if that love comes back around to you. Or if, the, or if the world is functioning properly, that type of love is done 
because you want to love. Because you, you have been so filled with the love of Jesus, you cannot help but share that love with the world around you. That, my friends, is a sustainable love. Because it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who God is. That God fills you with love and you're so filled with love, you cannot help but share that love with the world around you. That, my friends, is sustainable love. It's an overwhelming sustainable love. I think about all the conflicts that are going on around the world right now. And a lot of people would say, if they just, you know, if they just had good love growing up, we wouldn't have these conflicts. Well, yes and no, perhaps. But the love of Jesus is 100% sustainable because it's a function of Him and His love. And His love filling us with so much that we cannot help but share it with the world around us. The reason it's sustainable is because it touches our heart. We have this need that needs to be fulfilled. And when God touches our heart, it makes us love other people. Jesus tells another story about the sheep and the goats. And it's about at the end of the day, at judgment day, you've got, he separates some on the left and some on the right and says, what did you do with the gifts that I gave you? And, and, and they said, well, we didn't do anything. And Jesus said, well, you fed me and you clothed me and you gave me food. Uh, you gave me water. You gave me shelter. You gave me all those things. And when you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Like, when did we do that? He says, when you did it to anybody, you did it to me. The reason why that was such a powerful story is because they just did it naturally. That they had loved so much that it just flowed out from them. The goats are like, well, we love too. We, you know, we, we thought we loved, but they didn't love with the love of Jesus. They didn't love unconditionally. You are loved unconditionally. God pours out his love upon you. And when he does that, and you serve the world around you, that, my friends, is sustainable. And that's what the early church was called to do. They were called for the apostles' teaching, for prayer, for fellowship, for breaking bread together, and they were called to do this sustainable thing, which is to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to love the world around them. It is a great honor and blessing in our life to come to the point where we realize how much Jesus loves us and we are so overwhelmed with that love that we can't help but share it to the world around us. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, thank you for this time together. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to love the world. In your name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. As far as announcements, next weekend, next uh, Saturday is Trunk or Treat. Uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. And that's one of our big outreach events where we show love to the community uh, out in the year. And then um, also, um, if you're interested uh, in learning more about the Deacon or Deaconess program, I'll be sending some information about that. We have a vote uh, today and a vote next week on uh, expanding our facilities to use the buildings that we were able to obtain. Uh, and so we'll have that vote and we'll let you know the outcome of that vote shortly. But other than that, may God richly bless you and may you have a great day. Go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.